We're gonna need a big one. We'll wait just for a moment. You think? No. Well, we're thankful that you could all join us this evening, both here in person and tonight we are online with our Edge Wednesday service. Uh, before we get started this evening, uh, for a time of reflection, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to be able to have this service that kicks off the Lenten season, Father. This time of anticipation, a time of waiting, a time of repentance, a time of returning to you realizing that no matter what we do on our own, we can't reach salvation. So the Father, let us be reminded through this season that this is a spiritual journey that we are about to undertake. Let your words be heard tonight, Father. Let us meditate on them. Let us meditate on the scriptures that we hear. In Jesus' name. Well, as we get started, really we're starting on a journey, and tonight we begin a spiritual journey that spans 40 days from Ash Wednesday until Holy Saturday, which is the day before Resurrection Sunday. And one could see this season of Lent as a cleansing of the soul. Just as our homes fill with things, so do we as we are filled with the things of this world. It's also a time of reflection that is based on Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. This time of stillness, focus, and repentance is very reminiscent of the passage in Psalm 4610 where the psalmist writes, Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. When we do this, we can truly focus on what is important, remembering what Christ did for us. And the prophet Isaiah would prophesy this hundreds of years before. In, verse, in chapter 53, verse 5, he prophesies, But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. During this time of reflection, as we come into the season of Lent, it's a time for us to do a self-examination and to allow the Spirit to work within us and to guide and direct us and direct our hearts. As we begin that time of reflection, uh, we go to the passage in Mark 1, 12 and 13, where it says, At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. So each of the 40 days that we have in Lent, as Terry mentioned, represents Christ's 40 days out in that wilderness, being tempted constantly, not unlike we are today, and, and, and all the things that present themselves to us. Christ was being tempted every day by Satan, trying to draw him away from who he was and what, who he was meant to be. And so as Christ was enduring this temptation, this period of temptation and drawing, we need to be aware of the fact that we are, again, tempted each and every day to do the same thing. So we count back 40 days from Easter, excluding Sundays, to get to Ash Wednesday. So during this time that Christ was out in the wilderness, he was fasting, and he fasted for 40 days. Now... I could probably use a few days of fasting myself, but if we think about it today, that's quite a feat to be able to fast for 40 days. And it was to show his steadfast commitment to God and to who he was. So Jesus said this about fasting in Matthew 6, 16 through 18. When you fast, do not look somber as hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have already received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head 
and wash your face so that it will not be other, obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what being, is being done in secret will reward you. So as we think about those kind of things, and we think about the Pharisees in the day, and they would do everything they could to puff themselves up and show everybody that you know they were, they were the righteous ones. But here Christ is telling us that isn't what makes you righteous. It's that relationship. What you do in secret, the Father sees, and then you will be rewarded. So Lent was once viewed as a time for Christians preparing for baptism on Easter Sunday. And it wasn't until later on that it became more than the way it is today. And if we think about what we go through on, on a daily basis, uh, we need to be contemplative, to look back on ourselves, to have reflection, remembering the death that sin brings to us and our need for salvation through Christ Jesus. And sorrow, to regret and to repent from our sins. This 40 days is a time for us to go through and look at who we are, what we do, what our focus of our lives are, so that we can make that change so that Come Easter Sunday, we can be transformed into new beings through Christ. That involves daily repentance, dying to yourselves, dying to the sins that separate you from God, being reborn again and, and transfigured again on Easter Sunday. So it's a time for renewal, and it's a time for celebration, because Jesus has conquered sin and death and the grave. And that's a, a reason for us to celebrate and to hold on to these truths and facts as we go through this season of Lent. But oftentimes the question is, why do we use ash? Ashes have a long history in the church. They have an even longer biblical history than church history. And used by the church, which dates back to at least the 10th century, but biblically, we can go back even further. Let's look at Genesis 3.19. By the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made, for you were made from dust, and dust you will return. But we can also look at what ashes symbolize in the Bible. They symbolize frailty or death. Genesis 18, 27 tells us, Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. And also it can be a mark of sorrow or mourning. In Esther, chapter 4, 1 and 3, it says, When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on burlap and ashes, and went out into the city, crying with a loud and bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes in mourning. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was a great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. The ashes also can symbolize judgment. In Lamentations 3.16, we read, He was broken, or he has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. And then in Jonah 3.6, we hear how it symbolizes repentance. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. All of these images are are appropriate for the church's use of ashes for Lent. Ashes in the sign of the cross bridge between our human condition and the power of the cross. The power of the cross changes that condition forever. So you may want to know where the ashes come from. We always have a nice big pile of ashes here. Well, usually the ashes come from palm leaves, from the previous year's Palm Sunday celebration. 
And it takes us from that celebration back to sorrow, back to celebration again. So we have the celebration as Christ entered in and they were laying palm branches down on the road as he came into Jerusalem. And then that faithful time when he was crucified and the sorrow that ensued. But then again, he rose again. And so we go back to celebration. The palms are burned and mixed with water or oil. And then pastors use this to make a cross on each person's forehead. And we call this imposition. And imposition means to cause something to affect someone. So it isn't just simple symbology, but it is there to remind you that there is a change taking place. And to call you into that time of change, causing you to be affected. The purifying intent of the ashes is reiterated in Psalm 51 when the prophet Nathan came to King David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from sin. Again, taking us from sorrow to celebration. We need to make that atonement for the sins that we commit so that we can be brought back into God's presence. That brings us to, it's a time to make our heart right and for us to turn back to God. It's important that we understand what Ash Wednesday is and what it means. It's kind of like when we talk about taking communion or the Lord's Supper. It's not just something we do. It's not just a ritual that we go through. Through the prophet Joel, uh, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, God says, Even now, says the Lord, turn and come to me with all your heart. And in other words, in genuine repentance. With fasting and weeping and mourning. Until every barrier is removed and the broken fellowship is restored. Rip your heart to pieces in sorrow and contrition, and not your garments. Now return in repentance to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, faithful to His covenant with His people. And He relents the sentence of evil when his people genuinely repent. Well, let's, let's just go back to the ashes for a moment. Think about the leftover wood and ash from a campfire or a fireplace. It gets all over. In fact, when we prepare the palm branches for the service on each one, on Ash Wednesday, it gets all over and if you forget to close the garage door if you're doing it out in the driveway it comes into the house <laughs> lots of candles were burning and lots of uh, the warmers going to take that smell out thank goodness for Febreze <laughs> but it, it does it gets all over and then when you try to, to transfer it from and I use one of those little smokies the little tiny girls when you're trying to transfer that into the container that you're going to bring, it goes everywhere. And best described, and, and, and when you look at it before you, you know, bring it in, I took some of the pieces of the green stems that wouldn't burn or didn't burn, took those out, and they were just dead and dirty, just like the ash itself. And then, just like in a campfire or in a fireplace, the leftover wood is all hollowed out. There's nothing, almost nothing left. See, without God, we are spiritually empty like that wood. The ashes are a symbol of our need for God's forgiveness. And as a symbol, we need to remember that it is just that. The imposition of the ashes is not some mysterious, magical experience. You will, however, have some very strong feelings afterwards. We should expect to be obedient to God and His Word. 
to know that church is so much more than services and Bible studies, that we must go out and make a difference in our world. And we can make a difference in ending violence, homelessness, racism, poverty. We also need to understand that we will be persecuted at times for our beliefs. And if you think about the last three weeks of sermons, and even more than that, but the last three have really hit on this, it's about stepping outside of these four walls and going out into our community and making a difference. I was both pleasantly surprised and a little shocked that all those cards that we had made for Sunday dwindled from a stack like this down to this little tiny stack left over like that. Just asking people to be our guests. for these reasons that we're talking about tonight, that we want people to come into our fellowship. This is a promise of the open, empty tomb, and we just know that in the, yeah, at the, in the end of this book, we, read, we get to read the end, we get to find out what happens, God wins. Before we have the imposition of ashes tonight, let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. May these ashes be for us a sign of our frailty and repentance, and a reminder that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. So as we prepare for this time, uh, for the imposition of the ashes, um, I ask that you just come forward in here and we will anoint you with the oil and the ash, and then return to your seats. And during this time, we want you to think about uh, where you are in your life, where you are in your relationship to God. Reflect on that as we come forward and uh, receive the Go back to your seats. Please keep the table.
40-day journey to Easter has begun. And it's truly a season of prayer and of care and of share. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. And by the things that we have done, and by the things that we have left undone. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent and ask your forgiveness for our shortcomings. We ask by the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to have mercy on us and forgive us that we might delight in your goodness and your will so that we might walk in your ways and in the glory of your name. Amen. Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, telling his disciples, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And in the same way, later in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for the sins of many. Take and drink. As we spoke about before, this is not just a ritual. This is a reminder of what Christ did for us on the cross. This season that we are beginning, this 40-day journey to Easter, this meal happens the night he was betrayed. Yet he still took the bread and broke it, and he told his disciples what was about to happen, and they still didn't quite understand but we have the benefit of knowing. And so as each time that we take of this bread and eat of, eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are commanded by Scripture to do so until He returns. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and worship, to kick off our Lenten season, this time of repentance, this time of waiting. As we do so, Father, we just thank you for what you did for us through your Son, Jesus. Now, as we leave this place this evening, let us take what we have heard, take what we have learned, and let us be truly thankful, but also let us be humble and repentant. Because our shortcomings don't earn us forgiveness. Your grace does that. Amen. There's a passage out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 5, and also 18 and 25 that I want to read to you before we leave this evening. This is from the message. It says, what a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have him, this Father of our Master Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll all have it all. Life healed and your life is a journey you must travel with a deep consciousness of God. It costs God plenty to get you out of that dead-end, empty-headed life you grew up in. He paid with Christ's sac sacred blood, you know. He died like an unblemished sacrificial lamb, and this was no afterthought, even though it has only lately, at the end of the ages, become public knowledge. God always knew he was going to do this for you. It's because of this sacrificed Messiah, whom God then raised from the dead and glorified, 
that you trust God, that you know you have a future in God. Now that you've cleaned up your lives by following the truth, love one another as if your lives depended on it. Your new life is not life like your old life. Your old birth came from, from mortality. Your new birth comes from God's living word. Just think, a life conceived by God himself. That's why the prophet said, the old life is a grass life. Its beauty is short-lived as wildflowers. Grass dries up and flowers droop. God's word goes on and on forever. This is the word that conceived the new life in you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather here together in your name, that you are here amongst us as we bring honor and glory to you today. Thank you, Lord, for the promises that are contained in your word, the truths that are everlasting from days gone by and into the future. Thank you, Lord, that you are present with us each and every day, that your love endures, that your promises endures, that your truth endures. And because of that, and because of the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, we can endure as well in and through you. In Christ's holy and triumphant name we pray tonight.